really clean and I saw this gentleman blowing glass in a very professional way and I was like, I'm doing that, I'm trying that. So I jockeyed for a position in that uh, class, which was very heavily impacted. Only 18 people per, uh, per semester were allowed to blow glass at San Francisco State at the time. Got in and that was like it. I mean, I was done. So that was 1992. That was my first year blowing. So your mom was a professional artist? Ish. I mean, she she worked in the LA Unified School District for 27 years, but one of her roles was to teach. And so I did grow up with her making things, not like, not in abundance, but she could make or do kind of anything, you know, like in the area of art, whatever we might be calling that. But in, in terms of this, it's watercolor, illustration, I mean, man, it was the 70s, you know, um, contour drawing, and then she could touch ceramics, and then she still start, uh, carves stone today. So she lives in Montpelier, Vermont, and she's a stone carver. Yeah. She, yeah. What kind of stuff does she do? Um, it's really organic and kind of floral, um, Big amorphous. Large scale? I mean, ish. She's got, the stones are still uh, not, not any larger that she can't pick up. Okay. Yeah, so we're talking about the tabletop size, um, but really detailed and really beautiful. Yeah. I always think it's interesting, like, it, it seems like a lot of artists come from, like, an artistic background. They have a, a parent that's an artist. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I think a lot of kids want to be artists, but then this thing happens where they're like, no, I need to get, like, a real job. Sure. Um, but for for artists, they see that, like, there is there could be a future doing something like this. Like, it's such a, it's yeah. so different. Right. I also feel like, I mean, I feel the same, I feel the same way sometimes as I did back then. I was like, I don't even understand really what it would look like to be an artist. And even today we can say, you know, did you see all the memes that were flying around during COVID? It's like, oh yeah, you know, y'all thought artists were kind of useless and now you're depending on us for your music, your literature, your visuals, film, like, so, you know, what is an artist today in 2020 anyway? It's not somebody that's stuck in a small room making a painting. It's also the illustrators that are making Fortnite, and, you know, and imagery for gaming and CGI and like film and hello, like set decoration. I mean, this is like this giant world. Um, but I have to interject really quick and say, I was just chatting with my son who's nine recently and as kind of a, you know, a pokey joke, I was like, hey man, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know, maybe an artist. And I swear to God out loud, and then I feel horrible. I was like, no! <laughs> and I was like, but he and I have a really good relationship, and we get each other, and I'm like, I'm just kidding. I was like, what kind of artist do you think you'd be? And he's like, I don't know, maybe one for video games. And I'm like, boom, you know, there it is. Like, that could be a viable, he is a really good illustrator, by the way, at nine. Um, not that any other kind of art isn't viable, but we're talking about a commercial artist, which can we just say that that's maybe, uh, I don't know, a lot, a lot uh, more broad of an avenue for him to have things to succeed with or do than a fine artist. The fine art world is a, a small percentage of those people that are really on the upper echelon and it's controlled by a bunch of, you know, the canon, which is really weird, and, and there's lots of different stories about that. So, yeah, I think in being around makers as long as, long as I have been, we see that they're in line with other people in their families that are makers. It could be the grandfather, um, it could be mom and dad, it could be, I don't know what, aunt, uncle. But yeah, it seems to be like a, line a lineage there, for sure. Okay, so when, when your son, hey, I, want, I want you to go into this a little bit more, this is interesting. So when your son said, oh, I want to be an artist, and you know, like your first response, whether it's jokingly or not, was yeah. like, no, yeah. like what, what was behind that? Um, you know, well, this is the funny thing. I, I guess I don't know what it's like to be a software engineer, and I don't know what it's like to be a doctor, and all those trials, tribulations, struggles, debt, internships, but, I guess we could say they're they're probably aligned in some way, right? Like either way, you get to put in your ten thousand hours, and either way, you get to learn the ropes in your industry. 
no matter what that is. So, um, I I don't know. I honestly I see him in his world as kind of like an engineer in three D. So maybe an architect. And I just get to let that go, man. Like, look at how attached I am to who he might be someday. It's not up to me. Um, all I can do is uh, be a good parent and listen to him and watch him grow and take up interests and coach him as much as I can to make his own choices. That's my responsibility. So the no, I don't even know where to get from. That's <laughs> so embarrassing. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I would imagine, like, it's just like, yeah, you want, you want your son to have a better life, or you don't want him to struggle, and like, it's scary, I think doing any, a lot of things are scary, um, and, you know, I mean, there's a thing with proof of concept, right, which is where I think, like, a lot of artists, why they have, you know, an, uh, um, you know, maybe a parent or grandparent or something that has, like, professionally done art, there's this proof of concept that maybe it works, right? Sure. Yeah. And at least on the outside, somebody looking in could be like, oh, he's an artist, he's surviving. Like, yeah, it works, but when it's that, like, close, you feel, like, more, like, you you have a bigger chance or a better chance of being successful. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know the struggles of it, yeah. obviously. Right. And I don't think anyone wants their kids to struggle, but, but right. I mean, part of it is in the struggle, right? Like, how do you get... How do you how do you get where you are without enjoying the struggle and learning to push through it and, and get better? Yeah. Um, so from going from a um, like okay, so you went you you did glass at SF State. Yeah. Then what happened? Like right. And when when were you like uh, you know what like oh, man. Eh, I'm, I'm I'm not you know I'm I'm gonna keep doing this thing. This is actually a really fun dovetail that kind of just knocked me over the head. So. It's 1992, I, have to, I get to learn some things, and then I went to a professional glass school on scholarship a year and a half later, and met truly my first mentor, her name was Ruth King, and she and I kept in communication, and at the same time when I went to this professional glass school in near Seattle, Washington, I met my next mentor, uh, Michael Shiner, that same year. So, boom, there are two people that I get in touch with right away after about a year and a half, and I'm going to see throughout my career, still friends with them today. So, thankfully, my professor at San Francisco State University had pulled me aside at like the end of my second semester, and he's like, you have everything you need to have a career in class. And I, I think he was speaking to some raw talent, even though I think talent can be argued. Um, tenacity, integrity, showing up on time, keeping the studio clean, like doing all the things, right? Um, finishing my work on time, doing my best work, and being able to communicate with people, get along with people, things that you might need to succeed in glass blowing because it's not a singular pursuit. It is like a team effort. When you blow glass, you're blowing with at least two to three to maybe seven people on one team, depending on the project. So that kind of like, you know, he gave me permission. You know, sometimes when those folks just kind of wave a magic wand, they're like, you know what, you can do this, if this is what you want to do. Um, So I met Ruth, and then later in 1995, I went and did a residency with her, and then traveled to another another craft school called the Penland School of Crafts. Met another mentor named Thurman Statham, who was a painter. So I've been painting on glass and doing graffiti writing in San Francisco throughout the 90s, and he was very inspirational in letting me know that I could do it all. So I was interested in painting, glass blowing, and teaching. So he waved the magic wand over my head and he's like, you get to do everything. Later, I taught with him at CCA. Um, I worked for my former professor, uh, building his work and his career uh, in the American craft market throughout the entire time up to the year 2000. So I spent basically my time working for other people, helping to make their work, be a facilitator, painting, being a gallery artist, and teaching where I could, whether it was TA at San Francisco State or teaching weekend workshops at a newly populated uh, nonprofit called Public Glass in San Francisco. They're still operating today, God bless them. And I was like the person that was moving around the Bay Area working for everyone. And just, I was kind of the person. I was the person that would show up, make everything better, and pull teams together and make cool things happen. Then, 2001, Twin Towers got hit, and I lost all my work. I mean, like, overnight, kind of like the situation we're in now. Just everything fell flat. 
And it was at this time where, prior to the t Twin Towers getting hit, I just released a solo show at a gallery, um, and I wasn't making any kind of glass product for myself. I was making it for others. The lead person that blows glass for others is called a gaffer, and I was a gaffer at like four different studios and lost all my jobs. So I retreated into one of those studios and started a line of bottles. And then as soon as we kind of recovered from 9-11, I went out into the world and started peddling them, literally door to door. I would pack up a bat, like a box like that, you know, a tub full of bottles, and I was hitting these stores cold. And I just rolled in, I'm like, hey, I'm Joe Carrier, I'm a glass blower, and I make these bottles, would you like to see them? And they were like, sure. And literally started generating sales and marketing and like testing the market and just like, getting their feedback, like, you know, I'd bring in these shapes and a friend of mine, who's my friend now, said, can you make this shape next? Can you do a flat one? And it would give you another skew. And I didn't even know what the hell that was, right? Another item. <laughs> and can you expand your color range from five to seven colors, please? Because we like these five colors, but we'd like to see two more. We trust you, can you go work on that? And immediately and organically, I started my own business. I didn't even know, bro. But it was out of necessity. And that was about 2002. So you might be able to find a Joe Cariotti bottle out there that's like signed 2002, and they look dramatically different than what they are today. But that's how I got my start in business. It was like, this is what I needed to do to sustain my living and to continue my craft. Like I had to blow glass. I have to, man. Blue glass yesterday morning. Miss it today. <laughs> so, okay, so, you lost a job, 2001, lost all of these studios that you were at. Pretty much, yeah. Glass blowing, like you were talking about, and, and I didn't know this, and when I came to your studio for that one event, I said, Jesus, there's just like, like so many people that are involved to actually make just one piece <laughs> yeah. of glass. That's right. Um, so you had to have a team then, right? When you when you were like, I'm gonna I'm gonna blow this by myself. I'm you know I've been a gaffer for all these people. Now I want to do my own thing. Where did that team come from? Oh my gosh! At that time, Santo, it's crazy. I had one person I worked with. Now it's minimum two. Okay, and three of us today in 2020, because we're so good at what we do and we've done it for so long. Like our production, like we're literally in production. We're not really making art glass. It's not one single thing that takes 16 hours to make over the course of two days, la la la. It is, I am in production. And we can speak to that, just kind of like what my business model is and why, I mean, if we have some time for that. But um, there were parameters that I had set for myself and I always share the story with my glass blowers, but I also think it translates to people that are interested in uh, entrepreneurship or starting businesses. But it's like, what do you have to work with? How much time do you have to do it? And what are their, what are your constraints? And then what are the solutions? And where are the gaps? And do that. So I started this little like bottle line and it was one color, one gather, which is the amount of glass it takes for me to make the bottle, one assistant, and one box, which a box is an annealer, where after the bottle's done, we put it in an oven, the oven's at 900 degrees, and it goes from 900 to room temperature overnight. But you can see it was like one and one and one and one and done and just make as many as I could in a certain amount of time with this one kid. And that's how I started. And today, I mean, obviously we're in production, we have a lot of different products and we're professional and we know that if we make 20 objects in a day, two are probably not gonna work out and that's just what it is. And the numbers will all kind of take care of themselves and the law of averages and we have all the data we could ever need to relax and blow glass. But you know, during those times, it was like, oh my God, I have 120 minutes and we need to make 12 bottles, let's go. Like, <laughs> it's like really heavy. And you were able to do it. I kinda had I mean, to, yeah. we, we played the game. Yeah. You know, just kinda set a game up for myself and that was what we were, I was gonna do. And enrolled these other folks to help me out. And then it literally enrolled all the folks that I was gonna sell to. And then some of them I literally still know today, 100%. They're operating stores today. And this was door to door in the Bay. This was door to door in the Bay. And then um, I did a road trip down to Los Angeles because I'm originally from here, as I mentioned. And I did 
the Helms district and I went over to West Third and I'm not gonna kid I'm not gonna I'm, I'm just gonna blurt it out because it's fun and kind of awesome and why not? I drove down here and I left with like twenty thousand dollars worth of orders in two thousand like four and I was blown away. I was like, oh my god, I just made twenty grand worth of sales in like a weekend showing up with a box of samples and went home and then hired somebody else and just started growing the business. Um, and then I made a choice to leave San Francisco. So I, my former professor at San Francisco State left SF, got a job at Cal State Fullerton, called me a semester later and said, can you move to LA and help me? I'll give you a teaching job and you can use the studio to blow your glass. And another friend of ours from the Bay had moved to LA recently. His name is Josh and I still know and work with him today. He started a tiny studio in El Segundo right around the same time. And I said, sure. And I packed everything into a 27 foot bobtail truck and moved to LA to downtown LA in 2005. Done. And then uh, made some things happen here in LA, talked down to Cal State Fullerton, had to train a bunch of kids kind of like the way to blow glass, which is pretty specific in my kind of sphere. And then by 2007, went to the trade show. So you see, like the development that it takes from bottle one to trade show was, I mean, it was six years of kind of market testing and price points and uh, data collection and production needs and like all the things that we had to figure out. We, meaning I, had to figure out organically. Yeah. It took years, man, before I was ready to go to market. And we went to market in 2007. You want to hear about that one? Well, uh, hold on, I do. <laughs> I want to know, how did you go though, like, what was the transition from, like, I blow glass, which is very, very specific and, and like, is a whole thing, yeah. to, like, I'm a business owner. What was that transition oh, like? Man, I don't think the business owner hit me, Santo, until I took over the current space that I leased today. It was like, I got that I was running a business, and, you know, you can feel that when you pay your taxes. Um, <laughs> you have to hire a bookkeeper but it didn't really hit me until I took over 4,500 square feet in El Segundo uh, nine years ago so when was that 2011 yeah that's when we took over that space and I was like oh my okay this thing's full blown you've got employees running around you've got uh, new taxes coming out of the woodwork from state board of equalization you got the IRS, we got to form an LLC. I mean, it was like, okay, this is happening now. And we were scaling. And, you know, speaking of scale, 2007, we went to the trade show. I mean, I got Barney's New York. I got Nina Marcus. I got Jonathan Adler. I mean, it was insane. I came home, I thought I was going to be done. I didn't know that the work was just starting. I thought I was done, man. But that was really the beginning of uh, building that brand. And then stepping up and into adulthood and understanding that I was running a full blown brand and business. But that's that's four years. So like two thousand seven, you get these these huge accounts, right? Yeah. By, I mean, yeah. But I mean, those are those are huge stores. Like yeah. But you were still operating as the I, artist that did some business. I think I was, and I was a teacher. So I was imagine I was teaching mm -hmm. at Cal State Fullerton. So I was really loyal to heading down there two days a week and mentoring my students and teaching them anything from new genres to sculpture to basic glass blowing. And then picking and choosing some of those folks to train to help me make my work. And then racing back at school, racing back to El Segundo to Josh's studio and running all the production and then hauling it all back down to downtown LA and shipping it from there. It was brutal. I mean, it was six, seven days a week, bro. It was rough. I was so spread out. I was driving 500, 400 miles a week. Oh, I mean, can you imagine? Blowing glass in, in Fullerton, packing it, driving it to downtown LA, hopping out to El Segundo, driving all that stuff back, doing all the packing and shipping from my little warehouse in downtown. It was a lot of work, man. All on, your, all on your own, basically. 100%. Right? Yeah. The assistants aren't <laughs> helping you pack. You got to pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it was major. Okay, so, and this is, this is um, 
before before your kid was born, right? Because yeah. 2011, that was, was 2011. Born. You decided to start a business, right? That's I mean, what hit me. And we took over our own building yeah. and built our own studio. So now you've got overhead and you've Heck got yeah. mount to feed, no. a new mount to feed. Yep. Bye bye variable costs, right? <laughs> we have fixed costs. So when we were doing the, from 2007 at Josh's studio, let's say, you know, 2008, there was a major downturn in the economy, right? That was also very difficult. Um, so we held on to our dollars because we had a variable cost business. And then we regrew. We grew with the Obama administration and saved a bunch of cash and then took over the new studio. And uh, that's the same studio we're in today. Whew, man, it's been a long road. Okay, so today, 2020, um, where would you, like, what would you, what separation would you give between, like, Joe the artist, Joe the business owner? Yeah, good question. I remember kind of speaking to the, I'm a, I'm a graffiti writer, glass blower, and painter, and my friend was kind of like, can't you just be Joe? <laughs> Dude, you're all of those things in one anyway, right? Um, yeah, Santo, I, I love that question because I get to play and participate in the mindset. So when I woke up yesterday, I got up at five in the morning, did my workout routine and headed to the studio at six. And although I'm running the business, so to speak, as soon as I step in the room or potentially right now, um, it's all about being a glass blower. I just get to set up my color and figure out what we're doing for the day and set up my production runs and make the coffee and greet my boys and then we get to blow glass. All emails are ignored. Anything that feels urgent from another person, whether they want to see a new bottle shape or a new color, hold. And you know, at, there was a time um, when I had a brand director and I had an office manager and they were flagging those things as I was doing creative. Times have changed, we've had to reduce again. And so people get to wait. I get to make my things and give them full focus. And an email can wait until noon or the end of the day. And then I'll put on the business hat. Crush emails out, do the bookkeeping if I need to. Not that I do my bookkeeping. Enter, <laughs> enter orders, make production runs, order supplies, you know, clean, y'all, I clean the bathrooms. I'm not kidding, man. And uh, get ready for the next day. But today, for example, I am not in production. I get to go meet with a client. We're doing a house in Palm Springs for um, one of his projects. And it's just, you know, that's today. It's, it's like less artist and more kind of business and, and personal, which I really like. Love it. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to go back a little bit. Sure. All right. I, I don't know when, what year, when this would start, but like when did, when did like your glass, because your glass has like a, it has a look. Like yeah. there's like, that's Joe Cariotti, that's a Joe Cariotti bottle yeah. or, or whatever. When did it turn into like, this is, this is what we do. This is sort of our thing. This is our, like our classic look. Right on, probably after the first phase of development. So let's call it 2007. I think by 2007, so that's five year run. Um, honestly, my work was starting to show up on television sets and like McDonald's commercials and lots of press and you know if I can if I can tip my own little hat for a second at the time that I started my glass bottles you know these the angelic bottle collection which is the longest running best-selling collection of my career folks weren't making single color clean modern shapes in glass maybe one or two companies Maybe, and in the US, definitely not. Europe, maybe, but they look different. They're thicker, right? So there were a lot, there was a lot of criticism that I suffered from all these glass doors. Like, how are you ever gonna sell this thing? It basically doesn't have stripes and polka dots on it. And I was like, dude, I'm, that's not what I'm about. I wanted to make bottles all look kind of like a well-stocked um, liquor cabinet or a bar backsplash in all these different shapes and colors that would blend and interact with each other and I was also a graffiti writer spent a lot of time looking at cityscapes and I was like I want to make them look like cityscapes so they're all grouped in collections and started photographing them that way and people are like wow you know you can't just buy one huh and I'm like yeah it's my genius marketing plan you can just buy like a set <laughs> like a collection right so five years probably until it was really like whoa that, that's a JC like that's happening we can see that from a mile away. 
And do you, is it plans to change things or do something different or come up with, um, you know, the, the next round of like, GCs. Yeah, sure. I I think um, we have gone through we meaning the company because I did a lot of work with the brand director and we did a lot of development. We've done phase changes and we've we've tested the market. So I I mean sometimes I joke around that I'm like Zoolander. Like it's like dude, it's I have one look. You know, it's like but it's re it's really great. <laughs> it's got one look. So we have the Angelic Bottle Collection, large decanters, petite decanters, but then we released the Grappa Collection, which is really different, um, very kind of extruded, but it's still a transparent bottle with a stopper in it. That's had limited release. We did a, a line of bottles that were fully patterned, so they were like uh, black and white pinstripes that were vertical, and those did really well at Barney's until they went bankrupt. Um, <laughs> dude. And so we have uh, also touched uh, lighting. So we do table lighting and we've touched pendants, even though the market's a little oversaturated. So there's a really good example. Can we drop some pendants and make them look really good? Sure. Is the market oversaturated and there are lots of pendants that are kind of like that? Yes. Are there tabletop objects or installation type objects like my bottles and decanters on the market? No. So you'll see the buyers and or the, the public going for what JC does. So it's like, ah, that's branding too though, right? I'm gonna have brand recognition, I have brand integrity, brand identity, like we're gonna go ahead and flex that. And some of those specialized projects like the pinstripe bottles for Barney's, they're like your loss leaders. They're kind of like a flex, like, yo, we can do some other things, but this is our mainstay, 80% of our business over here, you know? Um, What's next for me? You asked that question? Yeah. Whew. Great question. Nobody um, knows today. 2020. Oh, no, bro. <laughs> June 2020. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're probably more direct to consumer. I've been really loyal. I'm a good Catholic boy. I've been really loyal to my retailers. I've never competed with them online. I've always kept my online sales um, at full MSRP and try not to, you know, try to support them. I mean, there was one time where we had 23 doors with Jonathan Adler, 27 doors with Mitchell Bill Bob Williams, then we were doing Barney's and Neiman's, and like, you're not gonna, you don't wanna compete with that many doors, man. That's a lot of glass out there, right? And then we have all our little folks across the country, and then some even international. Their stores are closed. So what do we get to do? I think that that's a really, what do we get to do? Not what do we have to do, right? You know, you change the language a little bit. It's like, all right, what do we get to create? Well, what's next? And we look at that kind of history and uh, of this kind of lineage that we're speaking to since my career of 1992, and we've seen stuff like this before. It's a little different, but what do we get to create? That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I mean, the one thing that, that I've learned it through my business is it's all about relationships. And so what do you get to do? I mean, you're always gonna be able to blow glass, but now start some new conversations with people directly. Right. Where there's not a mill to them, maybe. Sure, or like how do we pivot with our retailers today to support them in, in either reopening or just a relationship, just like you're speaking to, right? I Yeah, I think that there's been I mean, I know we talked about it a little bit before we jumped on the mics here, but the, there have been moments of pause that have caused us to be able to see things in a completely different way. I, I know it sounds maybe even a little cliche and it's been meme to death, but right? Like, oh my God, how can we connect with the people that we already know and really check in on them and see if they're okay? And then like, what do we get to do from this point forward? Like this is, there's like that line of demarcation when I speak to those folks that I've known since. You know, like Larry at OK on 8303 West 3rd, Holler, that guy's been supporting my brand since 2005. And you're right, Larry's the person to call and be like, yo man, how are you? And what do we get to do together? And how can I support you? And where are you at? So I think I've been a little, a little shy to like pick up the phone. Um, especially with, a, we do a lot of business on the East Coast. 
and I feel like I've been a little shy just be like how are you really because I think I'm scared to hear the bad news you know but having this conversation with you I think I get to create connectedness and you know courage <laughs> it's tough it's tough I mean, as, as business owners, we got to be uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. All the time. <laughs> That's true. All the time. And this is what a reminder 2020 has been about that. 100%. Grow or die. So I, I, it was exciting to hear that, that you have figured out how to, how to make it work and, right. and grow during this time. Um, Thanks, man. Let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to get back on track with some of these questions I, I like to ask uh, my guests. Um, what's the best advice anyone has ever given you? Hmm. Man, I wish you, I wish I pre, pre got that question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, I will call out my mentor, Thurman Statham. He said, you can do it all. I was like, I, it, this, this is, I think, is the difference. I actually believed him. You know what I'm saying? That, that's the defining moment. It was fully granted, and I believed him. And that was, that was why it was so pivotal. You know, it's one thing if somebody's like, hey, man, you know, you're the best. And it's kind of like hinky, and it doesn't, it, there's no real integrity in it. This was like, oh, shit. Like, that's, okay. That was, that was it. Yeah, the wand. Totally. He waved the wand. Totally. It was like, oh my God, okay. Like, and everything is going to be okay. Like, man, because I was young. I was like 26, 27, and I wanted to know. I needed the, I wanted the crystal ball. And I think that that's probably uh, it's just a phase that we go through at that age, potentially. Um, I don't really need a crystal ball today, man. I, it's not because... I'm established. I mean, we just talked about nothing is really certain. And I kind of love that in a way because growing up and hearing about artists like, oh, you know, there was that stigma, right? Oh, you know, you need a solid foundation and you're never going to be able to. And it's too uncertain. Man, and now we all know collectively nothing is certain. That is like, everyone knows that now. I'm kind of stoked, to be honest. We, we did fight through the 70s and the 80s with all those stereotypes, you know? I'm sure you have your own in your industry, too. Everybody does. But there is, like, some good collective stuff in general in 2020, not just because of COVID. I just think collectively people are maturing. I hope so. And becoming more aware. That's yeah. for sure. Hopefully. Hopefully it's not just our bubble, you know? Yeah. Time will tell. Um, and speaking of the industry, what excites you about still the glass blowing industry oh boy okay so my let's see the glass blowing industry for me and the way that i'm kind of operating is inside the let's call it like the design sphere so there were times when i was going to the trade shows two and three times a year and seeing things that were new innovative whether it be handmade whether it be cnc'd that was really exciting for me um you know, people like Tom Dixon doing these major releases. Uh, God, just seeing major brands like even Umbra. I know it's a mass brand. Keeperland. Like, I loved just being a lessee. I love being in that world and in that sphere. Um, in terms of glass blowing, oh my gosh, there's there is a lot of good stuff happening. I think in terms of community building and the educational systems have changed, so we lost a lot of the old guard, like my professor lineage is dying off or retiring, and to be honest, it was very uh, testosterone-filled and very kind of rude and very rugged. So watching the changes in the educational system and watching young people be able to do things twice as fast as as we did, like in anything, right? Whether it be skate, skateboarding or surfing, uh, glass blowing, right? Um, so seeing their advancements and their kind of excitement, um, innovation in glass, it takes a long time to get good at it. So in terms of people being innovative, ugh, it's like at least a decade just to get like the ropes before things start blossoming. Um, but I still have my, my heroes from even when I was younger making really amazing things and they're still going. 
we get another 50s and one of my mentors is in his 80s he, he's a ma maestro Lino Tal Pietra he is still blowing glass today it is keeping him alive it's really inspiring how would how would somebody get into blowing glass and is there like an age thing like you know you can't start at nine years old or right on I'm really happy you asked that question um, so part of what I just mentioned in terms of uh, like what's happening potentially right now in our industry, there are places that you can blow, go and blow glass and sign up for a class, and they're happening all over the country, whether it be in Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, which I'll mention in a moment, New York, Chicago Hot Glass, Florida. There are nonprofits and small studios where uh, a normie can walk in off the street and try glass blowing. They have limited small like one-time experiences and might be $95 to like make a thing. It's all assisted, like I mentioned. Um, COVID has definitely pumped the brakes on that for a moment. So folks are figuring out how to blow glass with each other because it is a close proximity situation. So uh, inside my studio, we were operating a project since last June that is on pause right now called the Los Angeles Glass Center. And it was a small project that we launched to basically invite the general public to come and learn about glass and blow glass. You were there. Yeah. Yeah, you came through. Yeah. So right now that project's on hold, but you know, Public Glass in San Francisco, a major nonprofit, is fully still operating. They're just doing it lightly like the rest of us going through the phases and figuring out how to protect everyone. And we'll be back and get in there. But you don't just have to blow glass in the university anymore. You can walk in off the street. And um, age, what age could someone start at? Oh, I think around 10, probably. Yeah. You need to be able to follow directions. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, and not be so afraid of the, the molten glass. It's 2,100 degrees in the furnace at idle. So even when you open the door, not that the kids would be gathering because we take the glass out of the furnace for them. You can feel the radiant heat just when you open the furnace door from like across the room. It's pretty an high impact situation and very special. But yeah, man. That's hot. It's hot. Yeah. <laughs> so ridiculous. Right, you can't even you can't even fathom like what that heat is. Most people. I mean when when we were in your studio, you're like, yeah, that's that's pretty hot. I know. You talked about the about the studio in um where was it, Santa Barbara? Yeah. Right, being a hot mess. A hot mess. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. probably the best way to describe it. Totally. Or Santa Monica, wherever it was. But yeah. Oh man, I still remember <laughs> there was like flames shooting out of the thing. I was ter <laughs> terrified. <laughs> terrified. Yeah, but I was terrified the first day I ever blew glass. It was scary. Really scary. But here we go. All right. Um, do you have a favorite book or podcast that you tend to recommend to people? Oh my Whether it's about God. business or yeah. Okay, have you have you read any of Jen Sincero's books? You're a badass? No. Okay, so she's got You Are a Badass. And then, oh, I didn't read that one, okay? I read <laughs> You Are a Badass at Making Money because my friend, my friend passed it off to me, and it is hilarious. She is, like, Italian, New Yorker, mouth like a sailor, kind of sarcastic, but full of integrity, really fun, light read, and very funny. And it's all about ways of being and mindset. So I'm a graduate of uh, Landmark. So I did the Landmark Forum, the Advanced Course, and I did the SELP. So you can look those things up if you're interested. But her, I think she kind of did like a lot of those things, but she did and had one shift when she hired a coach. That was like her defining moment. And it shifted her mindset and money. So that's what that book's all about. I am definitely um, into folks that have gone to MITT and Landmark and kind of being in that conversation. Um, but in terms of a good read, that one's like right here. So Jen Sincero, You Are a Badass or You Are a Badass at Making Money, which I believe is her second. Awesome. I'll check that out. Um, and <laughs> so if you could have a drink with anyone, alive or dead, who would it be? My dad. Awesome. Yeah. What would be the... Um, just to have one more drink with him. Yeah. yeah. Just to meet him as an adult. Why? Okay. Um, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to plug? 
No. Where can people find your stuff? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, on Instagram, I'm at Joe Cariotti. And the website uh, is www.joecariotti.com. And you can probably spell my name wrong on Google, but you can still find me. <laughs> that's when you know you've made it. That's when you know. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. And we'll, we'll, we'll put all of the information in there for people to get. Yeah, get, for sure. Get your stuff. I think once the Los Angeles Glass Center, which is that project that we launched in June, it's on pause. When we relaunch, uh, I, you know, it has its own Instagram, uh, LA Glass Center, at LA Glass Center. But we'll, we'll, you know, broadcast that not only on that IG, but I'll be letting that fly between all of my social media handles, my website, and then all of my team that helped with that project. So Corey Pemberton, Cedric Mitchell, Austin Fields, and Amy Stones, and Josh Gelfand. Man, we were on a roll. <laughs> we'll be back. 2020. We'll be back. Got man. us. Got us all. All For right. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Thanks Appreciate a lot. you very much. Thank you. That was fun. Thank